Welcome to Electrified, it's your host, Dylan Loomis. So Tesla may be dragging its feet with Giga Mexico, but the government wants to find out what's going on. Mexico's economy chief will try to meet soon with Elon to figure out his plans for Giga Mexico. Reviving plans for Giga Mexico in Nuevo Leon would mark a major early victory for the government of President Claudia Scheinbaum, who took office last month. The economic minister said, I'm going to set up a meeting with Elon soon so that he tells me exactly what he's thinking and see what we can do so this project moves forward. There has been speculation out there that maybe Tesla would shift this factory to the United States under a Trump presidency, but for now it's just that speculation. As we touched on yesterday, Trump has mentioned in the past that he would impose tariffs up to 200% on auto imports from Mexico. One of the last official statements we got about Giga Mexico from Elon was that Tesla would definitely build the factory in Mexico, but the timing of the factory would depend on the economy and interest rates. However, that statement was on Tesla's Q3 2023 earnings call where Elon said, no, we're definitely making the factory in Mexico. We feel very good about that. We put a lot of effort into looking at different locations and we feel very good about that location and we're going to build a factory there and it's going to be great. But the problem with relying too much on that statement is that a lot has changed since then. For example, in Q1 this year, Tesla told us that the more affordable models would be produced on the same manufacturer manufacturing lines as the current vehicle lineup. That was a big shift in what we were expecting because we thought Tesla's more affordable models would all use the unboxed manufacturing method and Giga Mexico was set to be the first major factory for that. Elon has said the CyberCab will be produced at multiple different factories, but to start, it's likely going to begin at Giga Texas. And we can assume at least one year to ramp up that new production method that will be unboxed, so Giga Mexico wouldn't really come into the picture until 2027 at the earliest. And the reality is Elon may not even know right now what his real plans will be for Giga Mexico until Trump gets into office and determines what he's going to do with the tariffs. So until we get that clarity or Elon gets it behind closed doors, I don't think we're going to get any official updates on Giga Mexico. But it does seem likely that in the event Giga Mexico is taken off the table thanks to import tariffs, then Tesla would move that factory to somewhere in the United States. Tesla may be preparing to soon upgrade the battery pack for the entry-level Model 3 and possibly the Model Y. This would be a new battery pack from CATL called the 6M or the E1A, which has a 4% capacity increase from the current 60 kilowatt hour pack up to 62.5 kilowatt hours. The user on X that reported this has shared good information in the past, and they said this battery pack could start initially on the 2025 Model 3 rear wheel drive. It could launch as soon as mid-November in Europe, and the WLTP range would be an increase of about four miles. It's supposed to weigh 2. 2 pounds less, and they're saying it should have improved DC fast charging speeds. The chemistry is likely to be either LFP or LMFP, and there's speculation this pack could eventually replace the BYD blade in the base Model Y, which would streamline the supply chain. Now, this part is speculation on my end, but you may remember earlier this year, CATL talked about new battery technology that could have a range over 600 miles, and more importantly, super fast charging. It was going to be the first LFP battery with 4C charge rates. So if this 6M battery has that same technology, the formula is peak charging power equals the C rate times battery capacity in kilowatt hours. So plugging in the C rate of 4C and the battery capacity of 62.5 kilowatt hours, that would give us a peak charging rate of 250 kilowatts, which would be a significant upgrade from the current entry level Model 3, which has max charging rates of 170 kilowatts. So let let me be clear again, there's no guarantee that this new 6M battery has those 4C charging rates, but it is at least possible and something to consider. However, there's a chance this battery pack would only be for Tesla vehicles outside of the US, and that's thanks to eligibility requirements for the IRA tax credit. Right now, all three variants of the Model 3 qualify for the credit, and a CATL pack would likely disqualify the entry model. And then there's the chance that Tesla is just getting ready for these tax credits to be 
be taken away, and in that case, they would just want to save costs anywhere possible because there would be nothing to qualify for. Clearly, there's plenty of moving parts, but anytime there's an opportunity for charging speeds to be increased by roughly 80 kilowatts, I think that's worthy of reporting. Battery storage developer EQ Energy has closed a financial deal for a 500 megawatt hour battery in Canberra in Australia. The two hour duration battery storage project will use Tesla's mega packs and connect to the Evo Energy electricity distribution network. The project is expected to be operational in 2026 and construction has already begun. Most of the deals we report on for Tesla use Tesla's four hour mega pack, which has one megawatt of power and 3.9 megawatt hours of capacity. The two hour duration has the same listed capacity, although in reality it's slightly smaller, but the power or the speed at which it can actually deliver energy to the grid is almost twice as fast at 1.9 megawatts. This project would require about 125 Tesla mega packs, so roughly $125 million contract for Tesla. One thing that's unique about this project, the Australian Capital Territory government will get a 50% share of all of the net revenue from this battery storage project, which I think highlights the financial flexibility and capital structuring of these projects. And the two hour mega pack is of course well suited for providing grid services that help maintain grid stability because these applications often require quicker response times and not necessarily for longer discharge durations. Cybertruck delivery day in Vancouver is now underway. We have Heinrich Zane giving us another quick update of the Tesla Semi Factory. We are looking at the northwest corner, um, and to the left is east, to the, to the bottom and right is west, and uh, in the background is south. Um, the new orientation is starting at this northwest corner. Here you're looking at Xpeng's new humanoid robot called Iron. Xpeng is saying it's powered by their proprietary Turing AI chip, which gives it the ability to think and make decisions on its own. They're saying it can walk autonomously and can simulate human postures like standing, sitting, and lying down autonomously. I was able to find the hands have 15 degrees of freedom compared to Optimus, which currently has 11, but that's set to jump to 22 later this year or next year. But Xpeng also said Iron can can collaborate with humans and other robots to assist in production tasks, sorting parts, installing screws, and more. But they did reiterate it can navigate various environments and terrains autonomously. They said it's already working autonomously on production lines in their factories, assembling components for vehicles like the P7 Plus. But given the limited amount of information out there, I think we should be at least a bit skeptical. This right here from Alexandra, Tesla Boomer Mama, is basically what my wife has been concerned about ever since I started creating content. In short, Alexandra received a piece of mail addressed directly to her home. In response, she was asking for more privacy. In the comments, the athletic medic, who also follows me, happened to mention a service called Delete Me, to which Alexandra said, I just signed up with them, being Delete Me, the sponsor of this video, and she did so for two years. Now, I already shared some of the outrageous facts about the data broker industry last time, but here they are quickly if you missed that one. Delete Me is an American-based company that contacts each and every data broker to ensure your personal information is removed from the internet so it's not being sold around the world without your knowledge. I've shown you my reports before where it tells me how many listings were reviewed, over 5,700, and how many listings were removed this time around that had my data. 25, which saved me over 74 hours of work. But an awesome feature I haven't mentioned is that you get your own personal privacy advisor. So anytime you have questions or concerns, you can speak directly to the same person. You can also see looking at the removal times for each data broker on these reports, some can take up to six weeks, meaning that without Delete Me, you would have to set reminders to follow up and check for yourself. So if you'd like to get your family's privacy back and support a great 
great US-based company, you can head to joindeleteme.com slash electrified to get 20% off using my code electrified linked below. Or you can use the QR code right on the screen. Because I know some of you are dying to hear this, you may remember that Chinese blogger that ran a brake test on a Model 3 a few years back. It turns out it was not a fair test. It made Tesla look bad. The post kind of went viral and Tesla ended up suing this person for defamation. I'm not going to read it to you. It's on the screen if you want it, but just know that his apology has finally been issued. Axios wrote a short little article about Elon, but the one thing they said, he might be the most powerful civilian Ever, which I think is a great reminder for where we're headed in the sense that it's really uncharted territory given Elon, his power, all of his companies, his influence, and now a potential role with the next administration. So I don't have anything tangible to share yet, and I always knew that the future was going to get very exciting at some point, but right now it really feels like the next three to five years should provide us some pretty incredible content for this channel. And obviously not just my channel, but all channels in the tech EVs Elon AI spaces. In case you're anywhere near San Jose, California, Tesla is displaying the cyber cab at Santana Row. The CEO of Nissan is now warning of an extremely tough situation and they're planning to lay off 9,000 people, cut production capacity, and sell about a third of its current stake in Mitsubishi. They're moving into emergency recovery mode and they've unveiled sweeping reform plans today. This after the automaker tumbled to a net loss in the latest quarter. They've downgraded the full year sales and operating profit outlooks and rescinded an earlier target for net income, saying it was too soon to give any accurate forecast. Overall, Nissan's goal is to cut fixed costs by $2.12 billion. We've been saying how some of the financial pain for legacy automakers would be delayed a few years. That's thanks to hybrids and them continuing to make profits with their gas vehicles. But so far, Nissan has failed to deliver a portfolio of hybrids, so now they're saying they plan to introduce some into the US market. But the emergency code red type of situations for some of these legacy automakers has finally arrived. And not that we're necessarily rooting for the demise of these companies, it's just that we've known it was coming. The Fed did cut rates another 25 basis points, so now the benchmark rate sits at 4.5%. Because of this, the auto industry is expecting the average interest rate on a 48 month new vehicle loan to fall by about 12 basis points. In surveys, consumers have said lower interest rates were the number one incentive they'd like to see, and auto dealers have been saying that interest rates have been the number one challenge, with two-thirds of the industry reporting feeling hindered by the issue. It's almost like Elon and the team saying affordability is the main issue was actually the truth. Just so you know, there are analysts for the car industry coming out and making their projections for what a Trump presidency may look like. The gist of it can be summarized by what one consultant said, what the EV market will look like five years out is definitely less, much less. They're expecting automakers to continually slow spending on EVs and delay or cancel new battery powered models. Car makers will also look for ways to increase production of profitable gasoline fueled vehicles while converting EV plants into facilities that can also build gas electric hybrids. From a profit perspective, it's a challenge because you've got a lot of plans with assumed volumes for EVs that are less now. So some of those plants might turn into hybrid plants doing both rather than pure EV. Audi has unveiled a new EV brand in China. It's going to have the same Audi name, but they're dropping the symbol. This is in partnership with SAIC and they're co-developing this platform and they're expecting to launch the first vehicle in the summer of next year. They said the customers in China are much younger than the rest of the world. They're roughly 30 to 35 years old on average in the premium segment, while the rest of the world is 50. And Audi sold less than 15,000 EVs in China in the first nine months of this year. Tesla Europe posted it celebrating the opening of the supercharger network in Sweden to all EVs. Lyft is following in Uber's footsteps as they announced a partnership with Mobileye and two other companies in the robotaxi industry to bring self-driving cars onto its ride hail platform. Lyft said it'll also collaborate with May Mobility to deploy self-driving taxis in Atlanta starting next year. Lucid has launched the configurator for the upcoming Gravity SUV and I have to say it's pretty well done. They have some nice graphics of the seats folding and the interior storage. They also highlight multiple different seat configurations and how many people and how many suitcases you can fit in the car at one time. 
I have to admit the interior screens look pretty incredible. And for a size comparison, Tesla's Model Y is 187 inches long, where the Lucid Gravity is 198.2 inches. The Model Y is 75.6 inches wide, and the Lucid Gravity is 78.7 inches wide. And the Model Y is 63.9 inches in height, and the Lucid Gravity is 65.2 inches in height. And finally, the wheelbase of the Model Y is 113.8 inches, and for the Lucid Gravity, it's 119.5. Clearly, the Lucid Gravity is a bigger vehicle overall by every dimension than the Model Y, and you can fit seven passengers, and it looks like it may be a comfortable fit. It's definitely still a premium vehicle as the only trim that's available to start is at $95,000. But I am really hoping that this does well for Lucid because if not, they're going to be in a world of trouble. Lucid did release its quarter three earnings and they delivered 2,781 vehicles for the quarter and produced 1,805. Their production year to date is now 5,643 and their guidance for the full year is 9,000 units produced, which would mean roughly 3,400 units produced in quarter four. Their Q3 revenue was $200 million and their gap net loss per share was 41 cents. Both of those numbers did actually beat expectations for whatever it's worth. Their gross margins were negative 106.2% compared with negative 134.5% in the prior quarter. However, if you actually look at the financials, you can see that the loss from operations for quarter three this year was actually higher than it was in quarter three last year. Roughly, $18 million worse this year. And if you take Lucid's loss from operations and divide it by the number of vehicles it delivered in the quarter, it's losing about $277,000 per vehicle. But again, Lucid did a bit better than expectations and ended the quarter with about $5.16 billion in total liquidity. Rivian, on the other hand, reported third quarter revenue of $174 million, which fell short of analyst expectations. This was down from $1.34 billion the same quarter last year. And Rivian's adjusted loss per share came in at $1.08, which was more than the $0.95 cent loss analysts were projecting. Rivian's deliveries were down 27% quarter over quarter, but we knew that would be the case thanks to the component shortages. Rivian maintained its 2024 delivery guidance of between 50 and 52,000 vehicles. Rivian's total liquidity at the end of the quarter is $8.1 billion. Probably the most important takeaway was that they did reaffirm they're on track to achieve positive gross profit in the fourth quarter of this year. Rivian lost $39,100 for every vehicle delivered in Q3 this year, and comparing it to Q3 last year, that number was down at $30,500 per vehicle. But given the production challenges, the revenue miss, and the lower delivery numbers for Q3 this year, that's to be expected. Relative to expectations for Rivian, I would say it was a mixed report. I gotta be honest though, I'm not sure how they're gonna go from losing $392 million in gross profit in the quarter to flipping that positive in quarter four. Tesla stock closed the day at $296.91, up 2.9%, while the NASDAQ was up 1.51%. Thanks to a suggestion I saw in the comments yesterday, going forward, I'll report the volume in terms of percentage change relative to the average the past 30 days. So today, Tesla's volume was 38% higher than the average volume the past 30 days. And in the future, I'll just say today, Tesla's volume was 38% higher than the average. Let me know if most of you guys prefer that change. Don't forget, check out Delete Me linked below if you'd like to support the channel and more importantly, take your privacy back for you and your family. Hope you have a wonderful day. Please like the video. If you did, you can find me on X linked below and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.